for you this morning, I would pass them out. <laughs> not to say it's not just, it's just got that sense, doesn't it? That kind of like, man, it's dreary, it's Sunday, I can take a nap. Look, if you need to take a nap, you are not going to offend me. Especially if you're up watching the Niners absolutely <laughs> destroy the Packers last night. Because I did not. I DVR'd it because I knew if I stayed up in the game, I would not be in good shape this morning. So you should be proud of me for having that kind of self-control and restraint. All right, this is terrible. I'm just trying to... Hey, we're starting in Ephesians. Actually, we're not starting. We're continuing in Ephesians. Uh, we're going a couple weeks on marriage here. And we're reading out Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 33. I'm going to read over again, over them again quick just to get started this week. Ephesians 5, chapter 18, verse 33. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the church, head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. <clears throat> By the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body. But he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. And I pray that you give us guidance and direction today. Help us to add nothing to or take nothing away from it. And help us to simply reveal what is in there. Work in our hearts this morning that we may lead changed people because of your goodness in our lives. Give this day and this time to you. In your name. Amen. We're going to be specifically dealing mostly uh, with two verses today verses 518 and verses 521. Um, Verse 521, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, and again, I, I use this a lot when I'm talking in these couple weeks because especially if you're new and you're just showing up and you're like, uh-oh, he's talking about submission and I've never heard this guy, I don't know where he's coming from. This is kind of a scary thing. Like, because normally the pastor says, I'm going to be talking about marriage and we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5. You're going to look at your Bible and go, okay, he's going to start right at verse 22, isn't he? See, because we look at the way our Bibles, at least my Bible, my NFB version is broken down, is right before verse 22, it says wives and husbands. So that's supposed to be our instructions for marriage, right? But it's interesting because verse 21 is kind of like this verse that flows from the, the beginning of the chapter where it's living as children of light into this scripture about wives and husbands. But wives and husbands, the scripture for marriage doesn't specifically start at verse 22. Look, here's the reality. When Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, I'm pretty sure he didn't break it down in, let me rephrase that, I'm absolutely certain it wasn't broken down in subtitles. Like he didn't say, listen up Ephesians, starting in verse 22, here's where you need to start paying attention for marriage advice. Right? We tend to do that when we write the Bible ourselves. Paul didn't break it down that way. Why? Why do I say it? Because this word submit is scary and it's dangerous. Why? Because most of the time we start in verse 22. What's it say in verse 22? Wives, submit to your husbands without reading verse 21. And guess what? That only works when you start in verse 22 if you have an agenda or if you're trying to prove something. I'm serious. That's the only reason you would start in verse 22 while ignoring, ignoring verse 21. We have to start in verse 21 because it all begins there. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I don't like that part. I just want my wife to submit to me, so I'm going to kind of ignore verse 21 and just start right at verse 22. Can't do it. 
can't do it. Gotta start at verse 21. Actually, we're starting at verse 18, so I don't even want to be talking about Scott. Here's the thing. It's sweet. I'm a sports guy, you guys know this. I grew up playing sports, I love playing sports. And one of the sports I loved growing up was baseball. Like baseball was my first true love in life, probably. Yeah, it probably was. One of my first true loves was baseball. You know, I love playing basketball, I love playing soccer, I love playing football and hockey and everything I gave my hands on. But man, when it became baseball season, it was good. Like everything was right with the world again. It got warm out, I could swim in the pool, we'd go to practice, even just playing catch in the backyard. It was just there's something about baseball I like. Well, if you follow baseball at all, this week something interesting happened in the game of baseball. They had voting to get into the Hall of Fame every year. They, they vote on who's going to get into the Hall of Fame this year. Well, this week they had voting. It was interesting because for only the eighth time, I think, in the history of the Hall of Fame, they voted not to induct a single member into the Hall of Fame. Now, get this. In this year's induction class, the people who were up to get voted in was the guy who owns the single season record for the most home runs ever, along with the most career home runs ever, and probably the best power hitter to ever play the game, and he did not get voted in. Besides him, was one of, if not the best pitchers to ever pitch in the game. Not only did he, was he one of the best pitchers statistically, he pitched at a time where the hitting was better than it ever was, and he was still one of the most dominant pitchers over a period of 20 years. See, I'm talking about Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Why did he not get voted in? Well, if you follow it at all, you know they didn't get voted in because they didn't get voted in because people think that they use PEDs or performance enhancing drugs. And the purists, the baseball purists, say, well, you can't get voted into Hall of Fame having an unfair advantage. Just can't do it. Isn't it also interesting that I saw on the news last night, I think it was yesterday, sometime, I saw a flash across the news, that Lance Armstrong is now going to be interviewed on Oprah Winfrey. Right? And I'll be honest, I can't stand Oprah. That's just my personal man. It has nothing to do with anything. Wow, that's my biggest statement of the day. All right. Man, I'm not going to bash you. I just don't like, I don't like talk show hosts. You know, you put any one of them out there. I'm not going to be a fan of them. I guess Dr. Phil's all right. Whatever. Right? But he's going to, you know, Lance Armstrong's going over him. What's he going to say? He's going to say that I use performance enhancing drugs in some capacity. And why is he going to say that? Because right now he's had all his titles stripped of him and there's nothing he can do about it. Because everybody's thinking he's guilty and he used this stuff even though he denies it. One of my favorite Disney movies of all time. And you're like, Scott, where are you going with this? You're kind of all of it. Trust me, it ties together. One of my favorite Disney movies of all time is Cool Runnings. Okay? It's just, it's a good family movie. And I love the plot. I love, but there's a scene towards the end of the movie where the main character, Doris Bannock, is talking to his bobsled coach before they take their last run down the bobsled trail to try and win a medal. And he says to his coach that night, he says, Coach, I just got to know, why did you do it? Because when his coach actually was a bobsledder, he's one of the best ones in the world. Medals for Olympic championships, world championships, all this stuff, until he got kicked out of bobsledding for cheating in his bobsled. He had weights in the front to help him to go faster. And he goes, Coach, I just got to know why he did it. And his coach said to him, he turns to him and he says, I did it because once you make winning your whole life, you have to keep winning. And he looks at me and says, Doris, a gold medal, a gold medal is a great thing to have. And Doris gets a smile on his face, like, yeah, you're right, a gold medal is a great thing to have. But then comes the kicker. He says, if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. See, why did Clemens and Bonds, if they took PEDs, do it? Because they were on top and they couldn't stand to go down. Why did Armstrong, if he did it, keep doing it? Because he was on top and he couldn't stand to go down. But if you're never enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. That same advice is what we're going to focus on when we're talking about marriage today. If you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Why do I bring that up? Well, let's get into the scripture. Starting in verse 21. Okay? Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now here's the thing, verse 18 and verse 20, I should say not 18 and 20, but 18 through 21 are intercon interconnected in the Greek translation. What do I mean by that? Well, let's read verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Okay, if you look at the sermon title for today, it's called The Power for Marriage. Plain and simple, there it is in verse 18. If you want to know the secret, the blank, fill in, 
The power for marriage is found in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. See, the Greek wording in this from 18 goes through verses 19 through 21. And I'm just going to read it out of my Bible because it gives a great explanation of what it says in here. Like I have this study Bible. It says this, and they word it a lot more eloquently than I ever could. The Greek present tense is used to indicate that the filling of the Spirit is not a once-for-all experience. Okay, what's it saying in verse 18? Be filled with the Spirit. This is not a once-for-all experience. Repeatedly, as the occasion requires, the Spirit empowers for worship, service, and testimony. The contrast between being filled with wine and being filled with the Spirit is obvious, but there is something in common that enables Paul to make the contrast, namely that people can be under the influence that, and under an influence that affects them, whether of wine or of the Spirit. What are they saying in verse 18 here? What's Paul trying to get across? What he's trying to get across is this. Look, you need to be filled with the Spirit. It's not a once and done thing. It's not a once and done thing. You need to be continually indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to be continually filled up. You need to go back to that well of which fills you with the Holy Spirit because that's where your power comes from. It does not come from yourself. It does not come from your own efforts. I don't care how many of these you're taking. It's not going to make you better. Your power comes from the Holy Spirit. See, here's the thing. We get so hung up on this word submit that we miss the true meaning of what's being said here in the Scripture. We miss what's in front of it and what's behind it. Only if you learn to serve others through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is kind of the message of almost of the whole New Testament. Only if you can learn to serve others through the power of the Holy Spirit can you be effective as a partner in marriage. <clears throat> Why? You're going to see this theme developing last week, this week, next couple weeks. It's not about you. And this is extremely countercultural to everything that you will hear in American society today. It is not about you. I love the movie Jurassic Park. And I'm going to date myself to the youth group kids here. I remember going to see Jurassic Park when it was in the movie theater. Right? Yeah, I know. I saw that eyebrow raised back here. That's cool. And I went to see Jurassic Park in the theater. My sister and I went to see it one night. And it, it was cool. You know, here's, it, I like to go see the big movies in the theater. Ones that are kind of blockbuster type and Jurassic Park fell into that category. And the whole premise of the movie is based on this. These guys are digging through somewhere in dinosaur land, South America somewhere. They're digging for something and they find these little balls of wax with mosquitoes that apparently mosquitoes constantly bit into dinosaurs back in the day and they got covered in wax and just were found millions of years later. And they extract from the mosquitoes, they extract the DNA to form their dinosaurs. That's how they start with the building blocks. They get this whole, you know, just beautiful presentation of how they make dinosaurs out of DNA. And they start with the building blocks. They start with DNA. Why? Because DNA is the building blocks of life. People, here's what I'm saying. Holy Spirit needs to be our building block. It needs to be weaved and broken down into who we are so that when you separate us and the Holy Spirit, it can't be done. It's all interwoven together. It needs to be part of your DNA. See, you can't keep the Holy Spirit over here and us separate and expect it to intermesh. It's got to be part of who you are. Why? Because when we're talking about submission, whether male or female to each other, it doesn't come naturally to us as sinners. We have to have help in this process. John chapter 16, verse 14 says this, He will bring glory to me. He, this is Jesus speaking, He, the Holy Spirit, will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Why is the Holy Spirit important? To make known the will of Christ and God in our lives. Let me say it again. Why is the Holy Spirit important? To make known the will of Christ in our lives. Can't do it apart from each other. I know this whole, this whole Holy Spirit concept is a little mystical, a little scary sounding to some of us. And that's fine. I want you to wrestle with it. I want you to deal with it a little bit. But why is this a big deal? This is a big deal because our society is filling us with the exact opposite message. Our society is saying, don't find your power and your security and your comfort in the Holy Spirit. Where should we find our power and our security and our comfort? In our spouse. 
And we learn this from a very, very, very early age. Here's what I mean. Last year, Kylie comes home from school and goes, Daddy, so and so and so and so, my class are dating. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Kylie is in second grade. So then, of course, I ask her all the normal questions like, where do they date? Where do they go out to? Where does he get over dinner? You know, stuff like that. Just trying to bake her to go a little bit and you know, think about how incredibly silly a concept this is. Sorry, that means prior brain when I say bigger. Anyway. Like, second grade, and they're dating. Second grade. And fortunately, uh, I say to my daughter then, I said, Kylie, are you dating anybody? You know, Daddy, I'm not allowed to date until I'm 16. Absolutely right. <laughs> well done. And I've been informed that she has informed her classmates of that too, so that's good stuff. But it starts at an early age, and it continues through junior high and high school. We've all been there. You all remember what it was like. Well, maybe you're currently there. How do you identify yourself? Well, by, by, by what you do, by the sports you play, or the instrument you play, or the people you hang out with, and the person you are dating. And we have this image in our head that is promoted on television and media and radio and movies all over the place that your satisfaction and security is found when you meet that perfect someone. When you meet that perfect someone, it just fills in all the pieces in your life, and your life will then be complete. And of course, those of us who are married all know that to be true, right? Exactly. <laughs> right? Because it doesn't work that way. It's not meant to work that way. It's not designed that work to, way, to work that way. If you're not enough without it, you will never be enough with it. And what's the key? The Holy Spirit. So here's your homework for this week, and I'm not almost done yet. Although I'm further along than I thought I'd get this point, right? Your homework for last week. Pray for your spouse every time you thought of them. I'll be honest. This is a challenge for me. Not that I don't pray for my wife often, but apparently I don't as often as I thought I did. Like, it was like Tuesday morning, I went, I haven't prayed for Laurie for a day. You know, but by Friday and Saturday, it was like, man, when am I going to stop praying for this woman? Because I'm praying for her nonstop. It was a learning experience. So, your homework for this week is to continue doing that, but also, anytime you're watching television, a movie, listening to stuff on the media, I want you to be conscious. Now, just listen to it blindly and not think about it for the entertainment value. Be conscientious of the relationship that we portrayed on that set, on that show, on that movie, whatever it is you're watching, look and evaluate the relationships and how they're being portrayed. And if you always watch something like MTV, this is going to be a no-brainer, you know? And those relationships are just so out of whack, you can't even describe it, okay? Maybe you watch a show like The Cosby Show, you go know, old school. I love watching old school Cosby Show episodes. Evaluate the relationships in the context of this verse and submission. Good, bad, ugly. What can you learn from it? What can you glean from it? Here's why I say that. It's because oftentimes we're being fed messages that we don't realize we're being fed. I like to sit down and watch television before I go to sleep because I just totally decompress from the day. I turn off my brain, I turn off everything, and usually I'm fed sports. Whether it's a basketball game or a football game or whatever, I turn it on if I really want to fall asleep, I turn on a soccer game, right? <laughs> yeah! Sorry, I had to get my jabs about soccer. That's <laughs> Be conscientious of what, you're, of what you're watching. See, this principle, if you're picking up on this, it's not just about marriage, but it's about the Christian life. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says this. Again, another letter written by Paul. In humility... Consider others better than yourselves. It's not just about marriage, but also about Christian life. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Does that mean that you are absolute the scum of the earth third? No. Consider others better than yourselves. Treat others with respect. Treat others with honor. Hold one another up. There's a great story in the book. That I'm basing these messages out of. Again, this book is called The Meaning for Marriage, Meaning of Marriage by Timothy Keller. It illustrates this point. And it's found on page 54. I'm going to read it to you because he just does a good job. And you've all had this story. If you've been married for more than six months, you've had this story happen to you. If you've dated for any amount of time, you've had this story happen to you. Not on the same level, but you've experienced it. He says this. His wife's name is Kathy. Kathy and I remember a pivotal incident in our marriage that occurred during a visit to New England where we had attended seminary. The two of us, along with our three young sons, were staying with friends, and I had hoped very much at some point 
to be able to get away to the nearby seminary bookstore just to see what was new, maybe picking up a few interesting books. But I knew that it would mean precious time taken out of other things we were doing together as a family. And it would leave Kathy with the full burden of caring for the kids. So I was afraid to ask her for it. I had hoped that Kathy would guess my desire and simply offer the time to me. But she didn't do it. And soon I found myself deeply resentful of her failure to read my mind. Surely she should know how much I love visiting that bookstore. I work very hard. Why doesn't she propose that, after, that I take the afternoon away and simply because I deserve a break? I began to imagine that she knew I wanted to go to the bookstore but was dead set against it. After a long and grumpy day helping Kathy with the kids and feeling sorry for myself, I finally told her how sorry I was that I had never made it to the bookstore. She was rightfully unhappy with me. She said, yes, that would have been inconvenient for me, but I would have loved to have given you that freedom. I never get a chance to give you gifts, and you're always helping me with something. You denied me a chance to serve you. I immediately realized, however, that I didn't want to be served. I didn't want to be in a position where I had to ask for something and receive a gift. Kathy was deeply disappointed and insulted that I had robbed her of the opportunity to do so. We drove home in angry silence as I tried to figure out what had happened. Finally, I began to see. I wanted to serve, yes, because that made me feel in control. Then I would always have the high moral ground. But that kind of service isn't service at all, only manipulation. But by not giving Kathy an opportunity to serve me, I had failed to serve her. And the reason underneath it all was my pride. My reluctance to let Kathy serve me was, in the end, a refusal to live my life on the basis of grace. I wanted to earn everything. I wanted no one to give me any favors. I wanted to give undeserved gifts to others so I could have the satisfaction of thinking myself a magnanimous person. But I did not want to receive someone else's service. My heart still operated like this, even though my head had accepted the basic gospel thesis that through, that through faith in Christ, we live by God's grace alone. Maybe it does sound familiar to you, maybe it doesn't. What was he saying? There was an obvious disconnect between his head and his heart. Look, this guy had probably been a pastor for about 20 to 25 years at the time he wrote this, this story happened. Okay, this guy is not somebody who accepted Christ yesterday. What's he saying? It's easy to look good on the outside, but that doesn't always translate its way and transfer its way down into our hearts, does it? And even though he's a pastor and he's supposed to be on higher moral ground, <laughs> that's scary to say, okay? <coughs> it still was a disconnect in his life. I'm guessing it's the same way in many of our marriages. My wife and I don't always communicate perfectly. When he said that line, I love the line he said where I, she should have known what I was thinking and then it developed into the sense of she's just holding it against me. I went, yep, been there. As stupid as it sounds, I've been there and I've thought that. And I can't tell you what the exact reference was to. I don't know why, but I know that I've been there and I'm like, and I say to myself, this is so stupid, it doesn't make any sense why you're thinking this way, but you still can't get rid of it. So what do you do? You sit there in silence. And you let it stew and you let it grow. Because it doesn't make its way from your head, its head to your heart. Pride was at the issue. And pride and self-centeredness go hand in hand, don't they? That's kind of what's written in your bulletin in the middle section. If you get bored and want to read through that, it's just a quote from the book that I thought was very, very intriguing. And in the middle of it, he says this, self-centeredness by its own definition makes you blind to your own character while making you ultra-sensitive to everyone else's. Let me read that again. Self-centeredness, by its own definition, makes you blind to your own character while being ultra-sensitive to everyone else's. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 says, Whoever wants to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What's Jesus trying to say in those words? What's Jesus trying to say in that verse? 
If you seek happiness more than God, you're not going to have either. If you seek happiness more than God, you're not going to find either of them. But if you seek to serve God more than happiness, you can have both. If you seek happiness more than God, you're not going to find either. If you seek to serve God, you will find both. It's kind of like this little secret passage that unlocks some stuff. Why is this so difficult? Well, we discussed last week, and I discussed even this morning a little bit, how our society, what do we value? What are the core values, even of this nation, of this country? <laughs> freedom. And what goes along with freedom usually? Independence. Independence. God. Independence. Freedom. This autonomous society. And, and, and even moving up from Lancaster to this area a couple, what, a year and a half ago, something like that, this is an independent area. We live on our own. We provide for ourselves. We do what we need to do to get by. We go out and we cut our own wood. And we do stuff like that. We don't allow the power to come from the power. We buy our own generators and go get this and that. We're independent. But that independence breeds reliance on self and not reliance on God, doesn't it? I enjoy cutting wood, so I'm not putting you under the bus for doing that stuff. I'm just saying. The habits we develop, develop independence, not dependence on Christ. Here's something that's interesting. Only you have complete access to your own self-centeredness. Only you have complete access to your pride. I don't have access to it. Nothing I can do about it. I can stand up here if I want to and try and make you feel guilty about this or guilty about that. That's not my game. That's not my goal. But only you have access to what's inside of you. And you have responsibility for it, too. This is not something that we should be relying on our own power for, though. We need the power of the Spirit to help master our pride. Why? Because the two are like oil and water. They can't intermix. They can't intermingle. When there's pride in your heart, it pushes the Spirit out. But guess what else? When the Spirit's in your heart, what's it push out? Pride. Self-centeredness. <coughs> your ego. We become filled with the mind of Christ. How do we do this? The key is in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now what's the key word I'm looking at there? The word reverence. And the reason I'm looking at the word reverence is in the Greek context, this word reverence is translated as fear. Now, we need to talk a little about, a word about what it means to fear Christ. Because when I throw that word out at first, you kind of all get this idea in your head. At least I sometimes feel, what does it mean to fear Christ? Like, I want, to, I want to just do away with some of our preconceived ideas. Christ is not a nightmare. Okay? To fear Christ does not mean that you make up, wake up in the middle of the night sweaty and shaking in your bed because you're scared of God. That's not what it means to fear Christ. Fear in Christ is not some phobia like spiders or heights or darkness. Where when you fear Christ, you get these jitters of like, oh, spiders in the room, right? Or you take somebody, I'm not personally, heights don't bother me much. But man, I've, I've been with people who heights bother. And that is a tough scenario because they just shut down. That's not what it means to fear Christ. Christ and God are not something that we fear. Look, if there's a little bit of that mixed in there because of God's power and God's dominion and God's awesomeness, that's okay. But it doesn't mean that we shut down in fear of Christ. Two definitions I wrote down. Fear of the Lord is to be overwhelmed with wonder before the greatness of God and His love. To be overwhelmed with wonder before the greatness of God and His love. Fearing him means bowing before him out of amazement at his glory and his beauty. Fearing is not this scared horror movie thing. Fearing is seeing what God has done. Wrapping your mind around what God has done. Not fully understanding it, because I don't think we can in our human mind, and just kind of going, wow, that's incredible. I don't deserve it. It doesn't make sense. The fact that you love me when I don't deserve to be loved, I don't get it, but you've done it anyway. I can't wrap my head around it. I am in wonder. I am in awe of this. That's what it means to fear God. 
What does it say in verse 21? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, out of fear for Christ. See, we discussed at the beginning of this that if we enter into marriage looking for it, to be able to fill some sort of hole in our lives, that our society says that's what's going to make you complete, that's what's going to finish up. Jerry, you complete me, right? It's not a Jerry Maguire moment. Again, that's why once you analyze relationships, you see in the media. Maybe they have you at hello, but it's not a you complete me. Can't fill that hole in our hearts. Only when God and the fear of God has its proper place in my heart will my relationship with my spouse be enough to fill me. It's not get your spouse and then get God. It's get God and God will make your spouse. Whether it's your husband, whether it's your wife. That person in and of themselves will never ever possibly be enough to fill you without the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. This is not only true of marriage and relationships, but anything you use as an idol. The question is, what are you using to fill that hole in your heart? It's interesting to think about. We need to have a constant indwelling of the Spirit and constant infusion of the Spirit as it says in verse 18 in our lives. Not only once we've got a building, a constant filling of the Spirit. Constant infusion. Go to God. Pray to God. Ask God. Question God. Seek after God. Constant infusion. We also need to have a fear and a reverence for Christ as a motivating factor. It's a proper fear and a proper reverence. It really comes down to an understanding of God's grace in our lives. I think when we fully comprehend the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the grace of the Father, we can then hold an appropriate view of ourselves and of our relationships. I'm going to leave you with these words today. Think about it. A gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without one, you'll never be enough with one. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you. Just for, just for me, this where we're at. And, and as we talk about this marriage thing, God, I pray that you would work in our lives. I pray that you convict us where we need convicted. God, help us to submit to you before we even think or worry about submitting to each other. God, only in proper submission to you can you reveal yourself to us. And it's once you've revealed yourself to us that we're going to be able to live for you, especially in our marriages, especially in our relationships. God, help us have a healthy use of fear for you and wonder at all and reverence of who you are and what you've done for us. And a knowledge that we can't do it on our own. God, help us to need you. Help us to lean on you for our strength and for our power, but most of all for our power in our marriages. God, society is telling us one thing, and I want you to speak to us through your word. And tell us the truth that you have for our lives. Convict us if we need convicted. Reassure us if we need reassuring. Calm and quiet us if that's what we need. But God, always help us to seek you. Help us to seek you first. That's what you've asked us to do. That's what your son commanded us to do. May the Holy Spirit be the center.